Oh, it is a problem. Phil, if you have my eyes safe, it's very it's fewer than what you see. How did you choose uh, meetings over Zoom, Jack? Teams over Zoom. Uh, Microsoft, uh, they just, uh, uh, they just, they, uh, David can talk to David here. We, we we saw some real opportunities. In fact, they, I was telling Mary just now before we get on, they, they're taking it to the next level. They, 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 they call it the hybrid paradox uh, that uh, people want to come back to work, but a lot of people don't want to come back to work. So how do you integrate people, processes, and places in an integrated fashion? Um, so they're, the, the head of Microsoft is really a sharp, a sharp guy. He, uh, he's laying a vision for uh, the future of uh, teleconferencing. I think it's going to be something we all have to pay attention to. You know? So why do we come to them? I don't know. I mean, you have a Zoom versus... Microsoft, we're a Microsoft shop, and um, yeah, Jamie, do you have any, why do we choose Teams over Zoom? I don't know. Uh, so one part features functionality um, that integrates with just kind of our overall suite. Two, there's a security piece. Uh, Zoom and, and Teams have very different approaches to, uh, oh, that's the other thing. Yeah, to security that we did not like the Zoom piece whatsoever and still don't like the Zoom security piece of it, um, where Microsoft has taken a very different tact on the um, security of it, anywhere from sharing conversations that you have, um, et cetera. So between the two of them, the feature set and security, it, it was a it was a no-brainer. Well, perfect segue into um, it's the top of the hour. Um, so security, thank you, David. Perfect segue. Frank Johnson, welcome. We have two Franks, so we're going to be very frank. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so welcome. We're so glad to have you um, calling the meeting to order. And before we start with our guest speaker and Jack will be, um, Jack, I'd love for you to introduce Frank. Is there any public comment? Any public comment before we move into uh, the next part of our agenda? Hearing none, uh, Jack, if you would do us the honors of, and Frank, we're welcome and we're so happy to have you here. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I, Frank is a well-known uh, IT executive. He describes himself as a former battle-tested ransomware surviving public sector IT executive, uh, and I appreciate that, but he is so much more than that. Uh, Frank and I enjoyed an experience, uh, I think it was 2018, Frank, December, uh, Amazon, as they were coming into town, wanted to do a fireside chat. And so they invited Frank and myself, Frank from Baltimore and myself, and I was honored to be there with Frank. I mean, his his capabilities, knowledge is far surpassed mine in terms of the experience and work he's done. And Frank and I talked on a variety of subjects in terms of, there must have been a couple hundred people there talking about uh, what the future may hold. Uh, and by, uh, by just fortune, uh, five, six months later, uh, there's this ransomware attack in Baltimore, and Frank had to weather that. Uh, could that have happened here in Arlington? It most certainly it could have. Uh, why it didn't? Uh, <laughs> frankly, uh, luck from my side of it. Could it happen again? You bet it could. Uh, and I thought it would be, I, I heard Frank speak at a uh, National Association of uh, Counties discussion, and I thought he was so eloquent in what he was able to talk about and what happened. I, his lessons learned from that event, um, his guidance, counsel, uh, I really believe uh, essential for every every public servant uh, to hear uh, and every citizen to hear because I think it has so much portent. Uh, Frank holds technical degrees from Johns Hopkins and the University of Toledo uh, and has spent many years in the private sector before coming to the city of Baltimore. So with that, I'll turn it over to Frank and, and uh, Frank, if you could in, Take it from there, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Well, again, uh, can everybody hear me okay? We didn't have a chance to do a quick audio test before today's call. Uh, we can hear you. I think someone are saying there's some lots of echoes, so if we can all uh, mute uh, when we come in. Okay. Welcome. By the way, can, can everybody hear me? Okay. I'll go. I'll go ahead. So, so I do have some prepared remarks, uh, but I, do, I would just like thirty seconds, if you'll afford me, just a little bit of uh, you know uh, table setting. 
First and foremost, what we're going to talk about today is about cybersecurity with a, with a focus on, you know, lowering your vulnerability, the things in local government to look for. And, you know, part of, you know, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, the people part of cybersecurity. You know, I will absolutely put forth that, you know, most cybersecurity incidents are precipitated by mistakes made in configuration by humans. And of course, cyber criminals, for the most part, are also people. So there's a big people component to um, to cybersecurity conundrum that we're all facing. Uh, and one of the things that you have going for you that you know out of the gate lowers your vulnerability is leadership. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about leadership today and their role, and not just your IT leadership, but the leadership of the county or whatever organization you happen to be part of. They absolutely need to play an active role in lowering the organization's vulnerability. But I, I did not, now Jack did not ask me to say this. In fact, you know, he did, we did not want to talk before this so that I could like speak freely. Uh, he didn't ask me to ask all of you for more IT budget, you know, although please give the man more IT, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't do any of that beforehand. I, I will tell you that you, out of the gate, your vulnerability is probably a little bit lower than municipalities your size. Why? Because of uh, Jack Belcher. He is, what you may not know this, maybe you already know, he is one of the most well-respected, uh, well-liked, and uh, you know, best all around public sector IT leaders. And that's just not my opinion, that's well-recognized amongst his peer group you know, actively sought out for insight, guidance, and counsel on a myriad of public sector IT uh, uh, leadership capabilities. And you're all very, very, very lucky and fortunate to have him. Uh, again, again, so I've got some prepared remarks, you know, to talk about in general, the incident and the event, and share with you some lessons learned. I would love this to be interactive as possible. Uh, I, I, I believe that, you know, Mary, Jack, if I can't visually or see somebody raising their hand or wanting to ask a question, if somebody could please help me pay attention to digital hands being raised, I'd be forever grateful. A um, couple of quick caveats, gang. You know, there, there still is an active ongoing investigation. So I am uh, somewhat limited, as you could imagine, in going into too much depth as to exactly what happened. And again, the second caveat is obviously I'm no longer an employee of the city. Uh, so these points of view and lessons learned are my own. Uh, as Jack alluded to a minute ago, I've spent a significant amount of my career working with public sector IT leadership. And some of the things that are happened in the Baltimore city or the environment, and you know, it's not unique to that municipality. I generally see you know, the same highly vulnerable environments across many municipalities because most local governments are in the same situation. Okay, fair enough. And if there is something that somebody would like to go deeper on a topic or a subject, you know, I'd be happy to follow up at any time offline. Uh, Jack and others who are here on the phone who helped host and get me here um, have my contact information. Okay, is everybody still there? Yes, thanks so much. You can feel and hear the heads nodding. <laughs> okay, um, hey gang, uh, first and foremost, this is a good way to start off by sharing, you know, a story and I'm gonna cut it up into three parts. You know, quickly just cover what, what was the background of the environment at the time? Uh, you know, what was the response effort? What did that look like? And spend you know a little bit of time on you know lessons learned and insights based on that experience, and again experience with others. So you know step one background. You know what I'm about to describe for you again is not unique to the city. This is generally applicable to most of the municipalities I've talked to and work with. Uh, first and foremost, right, a woefully outdated IT capability, and due to decades of neglect and underinvestment. By the way, that is not unique to my previous employer. You know, there's a lot of competing priorities within any municipality and carving up the annual budget to feed most of the priority programs, public safety, economic development, education, all of those major mission-driven priorities. It's really, really hard, and I completely understand that. 
What that means is that there still is a bunch of hardworking people are doing the best that they can to continue to provide a digital capability. You know, and again, in most cases, uh, under-resourced, unless you're lucky enough to be one of probably one of the big mega cities that maybe have enough resources, uh, resulting in a very, very highly vulnerable and fragmented environment. You know, when an IT organization is leaderless and without the will of the leadership on top, you know, there's if there's multiple IT fiefdoms kind of competing or doing their own IT stuff. You know, studies will show that highly fragmented environments are highly vulnerable. Um, so lesson one, again, you know, think commodity IT services are better served centrally. You know, one throat, you know, networking, email, file and print. Uh, each one of the operational agencies or divisions absolutely should participate in, you know, in the IT continuum. Their focus should be on their applications and their data. You know, but it, it, the more people who are mucking around in your networking and your cybersecurity and providing core services, the more highly, uh, the more vulnerable you would be. Uh, I was hired in the middle of 2017, you know, to have the opportunity to help digitally transform the city. Uh, today was a wonderful opportunity, amazing experience. Even with the ransomware event, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. Uh, in late winter of 2019, about a year after Atlanta was crippled with a ransomware attack, you know, the city was uh, in the news. Now, if any of you have ever visited at a state-of-the-art cybersecurity center, a lot of people say, well, gee, why are there all these big TV screens around a cybersecurity operations center and why are one of them one running the weather and or the news and the reason is, is that cyber criminals can't help themselves you know when they see that you're in the news they start to rattle your doors and your windows to try to get in it's just the way that they react and i'm sure that all of you are very well aware of the spike in cyber attacks on the healthcare industry as soon as the covid pandemic started so again unfortunately you know the city was in the news and the late winter, early spring of 2019, and lo and behold, in May of 2019, the city's primary network was knocked offline by a crippling ransomware attack. Hackers demanded payment of about $76,000. We're gonna come back and talk about that in a minute, put kind of one of those myths to bed. And at, after that, if you were following the story, you know, there was a resulting spike in U.S. state and local government cyber attacks, very visible one in Florida. And most people remember that coordinated uh, attack of 23 municipalities in western Texas that followed in the months after. And there in the resulting months, um, cyber attacks continue in all segments, not a spike out of control. Why are state and local governments a target? because they're highly vulnerable, they're soft targets. And unfortunately, they're, you know, the cyber criminals are well aware of that. What was our response? Step two, what was our response? By the way, it looks like some people have joined uh, since I started. My name's Frank Johnson, you know, uh, ransomware surviving, recovering IT leader from Baltimore City, kind of talking about the event and lessons learned and the response, please feel free to jump in and ask any questions, raise your hand at any time. Um, what was our response? You know, the network was taken offline immediately. Uh, authorities were contacted. You know, leadership was briefed. Uh, city operational agencies uh, immediately and quickly and swiftly uh, switched to manual mode. You know, our phones uh, continued to operate. They weren't impacted. But the city switched to manual mode to continue to provide services to the citizen. Our city's emergency management team set up shop in the central IT department to help coordinate communications. It was emergency. It was a digital emergency. Uh, they were great partners in that. Uh, we quickly assembled an expert uh, incident response team in, in pretty much record time. You know, we started the effort of quarantining the ransomware gathering evidence, handing it over to authorities, and then began the process of remediating any damage that had been do done and then started down the path to restoring uh, digital services. Um, services were restored in roughly about three months. 
you know, it was about half the time it took Atlanta to get services restored. It wasn't because we were any better than the city of Atlanta, but it was a year later because this is happening at such an alarming rate. You know, we had access to much more capability and expertise, best practices in order to quarantine, remediate and recover that might not have been available to them. Um, and then again, this is something else we'll touch on in the lessons learned. You know, recovery process is still ongoing to this day. Okay, any questions so far before we get to the third third section? No, that's great. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Appreciate it. Um, okay, gang, first and foremost, insights, lessons learned. Uh, you know, cybersecurity is a people issue, first and foremost, starting with leadership, getting back to highly vulnerable organizations. You know, from what I've seen and experienced myself, if uh, two things matter to the leadership, then typically your vulnerability is lower. The first thing is uh, business continuity or emergency management or COOP, continuity of operations planning. You know, a lot of local governments do COOP planning and they do it very well. There's a snow emergency. We can't get downtown. How do we continue to provide services? They do that very well. Not every one of these continuity of the operations plan factor in, well, what happens if I lose some part or all of my digital capability? Is that represented in my business continuity planning? You know, and how, how, does, how do I continue as a business leader or a, a department head, continue to provide service if I factor that into my, you know, emergency planning? There's not definitely not enough of that going on. Number two, is managing risk a priority for the municipality's leadership? Now, why is that important? Because investments in cybersecurity are part of managing risk. And if risk management, risk analysis, risk mitigation, best practices and all things risk is a priority for leadership, you know, from a top down perspective, investments in cyber should be a natural fallout of that. What happens in most municipalities today, if there's a void there, if you're lucky enough to have a cybersecurity team, they're left to their own devices, having to beg, borrow, and steal, appeal for more. You know, as a result, an organization is likely more vulnerable than they should be. So I'm a certified leadership instructor. Pat, I'm passionate about leadership. I'm a big believer in the buck stops here, there. If it matters to leadership, it matters to the organization emergency planning, risk management. If those two things are there and matter to leadership, that organization that they serve is likely less vulnerable than those that aren't. Unfortunately, in most of the local governments I work with, with all of the other competing priorities that local government leaders are faced with, there tends more often than not to be a void there. Um, a little bit closer to home for Jack and others, uh, the cybersecurity team, uh, keeping all documentation up to date. Your cybersecurity policy is necessary, but wo woefully uh, insufficient. I've seen a number of organizations that will post on a website. Here's my cybersecurity policy. Here it is. This is how, when and where everybody will log in. Here's our password policy. There you go. And they post it on a website. In other words, it, it, does, it doesn't mean anything until it becomes a living document. Here's another role for leadership. Does leadership continue to reinforce that that is the policies that everybody must adhere to, independent of where you are organizationally? And is it reinforced? You know, key lesson number two, are cyber audits part of the audit department's priority? Do they do them at all? because there needs to be some reinforcing mechanism, just like financial audits and operational audits. There needs to be cyber audits. Why? To continue to reinforce the cyber policies. It's one of your best defenses to make sure that your cyber policy is absolutely a living document. Next, but last, next up, you know, it, we're kind of past that point uh, with, uh, in the cybersecurity industry of that old cliche, it's not a matter of if, but when, you know, it's absolutely going to happen. There's no way you can stop it. There's no such thing as perfect security. There's no such thing as zero vulnerability. 
So you need to be as prepared as possible for the inevitable. So incident response planning has got to be a priority. Everything, you know, who's the team? When do they get called in? Who gets briefed? You know, what is the communication plan? Do we have a experts that can help us manage the message? You know, as we're talking to constituents, to leaders, uh, you know, the, an incident response plan well thought out ahead of time. And just like the incident response, I'm sorry, the cyber policy I just talked about, it's, it's one thing to have an incident response plan. It's another thing to practice it. So the, in the event of emergency, it's almost like muscle memory. Everybody knows what to do coolly and calmly. Uh, very few organizations have an incident response plan. And those who have them, very few of those actually practice them. In other words, let's have a drill and then continue to improve it. So I strongly encourage you to make incident response a priority incident response planning and incident response drilling. Um, I just, th this is a, one of my pet peeves around, you know, ransomware and listening to stuff on the news and, you know, gee, why don't you just pay the ransom? Oh, they only asked for $70,000. Isn't that cheaper than going through the pain and agony of doing the remediation, quarantine, remediation and recovery? Uh, I can tell you from personal experience and people that understand this industry uh, unequivocally, paying the ransom does not, let me say that again, paying the ransom does not speed up your recovery at all. Especially if your objective is to recover your IT capability in a very safe and secure manner, in fact, more safely and securely than pre-incident. There are certain steps that one must go through to make sure that every indicator of compromise is eradicated from your environment before you bring systems back online. And all argue and so will others that quickly decrypting a bunch of systems with a key given back from a bunch of cyber criminals and throwing those systems back into production is reckless and unsafe. In case that was questioned by, you know, I'd be happy to discuss and debate that. Um, last but not least, you know, in the event of an incident, you're really going to want to know who your partners are and who's going to come to your aid. So there's going to be a team of folks, you know, hopefully that you will bring in to help, you know, post incident, get to know them ahead of time. You know, uh, it's one of those things you, you, I, I would argue with all of the other competing priorities. There are certain things that you want to outsource or hire in as expertise when you need it. Hopefully you'll never need it. But having an incident response team on retainer at the ready in the event of an emergency, that if you have such an arrangement, you want to get to know them ahead of time. And it's a very, very, very stressful situation that you're in. You know, a, a lot of stress uh, in having relationships choreographing, drilling an incident response or a post incident, uh, getting to know the people you're going to be working with in that stressful situation will just help that all of that goes as, as smoothly as possible. Anyway, gang, that was, you know, that, that that's my story and I'm sticking to it. That was the background, our response, you know, and for what it's worth, you know, some some insights on things that you should be thoughtfully considering if you're not doing so already. And I would be happy to answer any questions that I can or engage in any uh, dialogue if there's any follow up. Great. Uh, lots of hands, uh, Frank. Thank you so much. There's one from Phil. Um, did you have a principal vendor for cybersecurity software? Boy, this is a, a Phil. By the way, can give me a little context. Phil is. I, I, I know I, I did as much research as I could online to get to know all of you ahead of time, but I couldn't Phil. Oh, there's Phil up there, Phil. And Phil is with, I'm sorry, Mary, can, can, can you ask people? Yeah, uh, Phil, Phil, un, um, unmute and introduce yourself. Go ahead. No, nope. I'm a self-employed, uh, long, long career in the telecom industry. Phil, pleasure to meet you. And the question is again. I'll just uh, read what I wrote. Uh, did you have a principal vendor for cybersecurity software? 
Yeah, so this is interesting, Phil. Um, the answer is yes, uh, but probably in hindsight, and this is, this is typical of organizations that are left to their own devices, just trying to do the best they can to protect the perimeter, okay? And by the way, my heart goes out to them, right? Hardworking men and women. Typically what happens is you wind up with a mishmash of too many things. And maybe you're not completely uh, committed to deploying, you know, a handful of them. Uh, so I've, I've talked to a number of CISOs across the country, and there's a number of them that are going through this kind of less is more. Hey, why don't we like trim the number of cyber tools that we use and fully commit to them? What happens? Better cybersecurity experience this is another example of addition by subtraction. By the way, I heard the comments earlier when I joined in. You know, I, I absolutely agree with David's comments about uh, uh, Teams versus Zoom. By the way, I love Zoom, like all tech companies. But in an organization that's committed to the Microsoft stack, tightly integrated in with Microsoft Office, there are some inherent security capabilities you get by adopting Teams over something else because you've already got a sunk cost investment in, in Office. Uh, so, so instead of adding yet another tool, you know, double down on the one that you're probably already paying for as part of your office license, that kind of thing. So, no, there was, there's never one, just one tool film. You know, you need a, you know, a, a, a monitoring capability. You need endpoint protection capability. You know, you need some a vulnerability capability. You need some expertise, some outsourced help to stitch it all together. A handful of tools is usually, you know, the right mix. Certainly not one, but certainly not 10. You know, just what is the right mix and fully commit to them. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you, thanks. Phil. And uh, Joshua, you are you are next in the lineup. So you want to introduce yourself and ask your question? Yes, yes, absolutely. So hi, uh, my name is Joshua Farah. I am uh, uh, professionally a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow. I'm on detail to the Department of Veterans Affairs. I live in Arlington. Um, I think a lot about technology and civil rights. Um, but uh, first and foremost, I am a, a software developer uh, with background in open source technology, uh, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, uh, the LAMP stack, you name it. And um, you brought up the, the Microsoft stack. And this is one thing that continues to vex me is given the prevalence of vulnerabilities and, and attacks that specifically target the Microsoft platform. Do you think there's a particular reason we don't tend to see more open source software or greater use of Linux where it could actually uh, improve our security profile? I'm, a, I'm an absolute huge fan of Linux. Um, but now we could talk, we could unpack. By the way, pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much for the question. I love the resume. Sounds like you have a fantastic career ahead of you. I actually know a couple of employers that might like to talk to you if you want to send me a resume if you're looking for a new job. Um, gosh, I could unpack this a lot, okay? I'm a huge fan of open source. I'm a big fan of Linux. You know, I'm a big fan of a little bit of diversity in your environment because if the if your adversary knows that you have, you know, the same thing everywhere, you know, there's only one attack vector. So having a mix of operating system capability of Windows and Linux in your environment, you know, might provide you a little more, you know, less vulnerability once the bad guys get in and start moving around inside of your environment. Uh, however, now let's let's let, let let's talk about the harsh reality. You know, most local government IT shops are absolutely strapped. They don't have the ability to roll their own code. By definition, they have to rely on commercial off the shelf. I mean, it's just re the reality of it. Yes, we all are well aware of the fact that the most cybersecurity attacked, you know, website on the planet is Microsoft.com. Why? Because they serve millions of customers in their massive infrastructure. So they're a very high target. I also know that they spend millions of dollars on cybersecurity and have an army of cybersecurity analysts. Most, most local government IT uh, shops are lucky if they have one or two cybersecurity engineers. And their job is to hold off an army of cyber criminals who work around the clock trying to get in their environment. 
So I, I, again, we could unpack that for a very, very long time. Yeah, I, I think that the, the practical reality of budgets and resources drive local government customers to commercial off the shelf and try to leverage as much as they can out of what they can what they get in a license. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, in in, in a standard Microsoft license, you know, you, you probably have access to more tools through that license per user than you're using. Well, why'd you go off and buy some other tool to replace one of those things? You're already, it's, it, you have to be very, very smart about the resources that you're afforded. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm absolutely with the sentiment. Big fan of open source. If I had a large IT shop and an unlimited budget, I'd be doing a lot of rolling my own code, a lot more on op uh, alternative operating systems. But again, the practical reality of the resources at hand for most public sector IT shops kind of force you in a certain direction out of necessity. Um, Mike, you have a question. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Mike, you have a question. You want to introduce yourself yeah, and then ask the question you have in the chat? Hey, Mike. Sure. Hey there. Uh, thanks for coming to join us and help us out. Um, I'm a retired CIO from the federal government. I have my own war stories about uh, cyber, but uh, none that matches yours, so you have my complete sympathy. Um, my question, which I put in the chat room, is during your tenure in Baltimore as CEO, did you have control over connection of all devices to your citywide data network environment and control over pre-launching security testing of application systems? And then is it possible for Jack here in Arlington to control risk without such authorities and controls? Okay. Um, you know, the answer is no. The organization that we inherited was federated um, and still in some ways is. And by the way, I, I completely understand this. If you're if you're the head of a department or a division, you know, you're an executive. You have a responsibility to understand how to run that business or that mission. And what comes part of that is I'll call like the four big horizontal support groups, finance, HR, IT and legal. OK. And depending on how your organization, sometimes HR is federated. In other words, all the departments have their own HR. Sometimes it's centralized. Sometimes finance, all the CFOs and departments report to the Department of Finance. Sometimes it's federated. You know, in my humble opinion, based on current thinking in the last 20 years, the more centralized those core services are, the better the consistency of HR, finance, IT, and legal across those operating ent entities. Now, the executive or the department head is like, hey, I got a business to run. I have a mission. I need my own HR team. I need my own finance team. I need my own IT department. And I understand that constant tussle. I, I really do. However, you know, the trend has been for a long time for commodity services, networking, cyber, mail, file, print, those things are much better off centrally managed. The departments absolutely should be an active participant in the IT continuum. Focus higher up on the stack, the application and data. That's where they should focus. Should they be worrying about, you know, password, login ID, authorization? No, why? And again, studies will show that the more centrally managed that capability is, the lower your vulnerability is. In my again, that's not just my opinion. I think that's that's well recognized. So highly fragmented, especially at the commodity services level, your organization is the more vulnerable you are. Now I will tell you a story because this is a matter of public record. After we were ransomware attacked, you know the city's C, uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, officer, the CISO, reported to me. Uh, she was responsible for writing the cybersecurity policy for the city, but she just reported to me. There were these other IT capabilities that were here, there, and everywhere because we we're a federated model. So again, here's the role of leadership. You know, thou shalt follow this cybersecurity policy, even though this person reports to Frank, all of you need to follow. The weeks after Baltimore City was ransomware attacked, the governor of Maryland has a similar structure. There's a central office of IT at the state level. However, that state centralized 
IT department does not serve all the departments in the state. There are other IT shops. The state CISO reported to that state CIO, who was responsible for the cybersecurity policy. In the weeks following the Baltimore City ransomware attack, Governor Hogan put out a, pro, uh, again, it's a proclamation, I don't think that's the right technical term, <laughs> wrote a memo to all state employees, this is the state CISO, here's our cybersecurity policy, what he says goes for all of you, even if you don't get services from the central IT shop. Any questions? So, yeah, I, I don't know if I directly answered your question, but there's... Oh, well, a, just a quick follow-up, I'd say, I'd say if there were a set of pre launch security tests protocols, then it would matter less who the person who ran them reported to, and it would matter more whether there was observable evidence that the tests had been passed. Tell, you know something, Mike? I, I absolutely promise when we meet face-to-face -face over a glass of wine, I'll buy the wine and we'll unpack that for a couple of hours. <laughs> 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 um, um, Frank, thank you. I uh, our one of our board members, Takis uh, Karatonis, has has joined us, and so I'll. Um, I was going to ask this question anyway, but um, now that you're here, Takis is even better. Um, was wondering um, before the attack, how much the decision makers you talked about in terms of the leadership of of the city had run through, and you had a great term in terms of muscle memory right? How much they had run through the what if, you know, what if we are attacked, what will we do? Not just your shop in terms of IT, but I'm talking about the elected officials in terms of, of what kind of preparation did they have? And if you were going to roll the clock back before, would you have suggested them to do some something else in preparation? So Mary, this is, I, I'm, I'm surprised it took this long to ask because I always get asked a question when we have these talks, you know, what would you have done different? Well, your great auntie would always tell you what? Hindsight is 2020. Yeah, of course, I would have ran right over to patient zero. By the way, for those that don't know, patient zero is so commonly referred to as the point of entry where the bad guys get in. I would have run right over to patient zero and disconnected from the network. What do you think I would have done? By the way, I'm, okay, I'll stop being a, a smart aleck now and answer your question. Um, one of those things that you, I don't think you can be prepared enough for uh, an emergency or an incident like this. So yes, the city took very seriously emergency management and response. There was an office dedicated to it. You know, citywide initiative to update coop planning, I know what you guys call them, continuity of operation plan. Businesses call them corporate business continuity plan. You know, what happens when I lose some part or all of my capability, people, process, or technology? You know, and, and, and is that a part of their charge? The answer is absolutely yes. You know, and by the way, we got very, very high marks. Uh, the U.S. federal government's leading cybersecurity agency, CISA, wonderful partners, great agency. That They need more, too, and they're getting more based on what I've been reading and following in the news. Uh, they came in and wrote an after action report, lessons learned. You know, they gave us incredibly high marks for our, our response. You know, but, you know, things like communication, right? Part of your incident response plan could have done a better job communicating, even though we did the best, you know, the best effort at the time. So, yeah, the, you know, even practicing something like, you know, what is the well synthesized question and answers? You know, what? Who's responsible for calling who? I'm talking about the communication plan within your incident response plan. Yeah, absolutely. There, you know, could have done a little bit better there. You know, it's one of those things that I don't think that you can be, you can practice enough. But to answer your specific question, did my former employer take emergency planning, emergency management seriously? Absolutely. Yeah, I was I was more focusing on what kind of conversation the senior leadership had separate from your IT folks in terms of how they would respond. Would they pay the ransom, not pay the ransom? Would they, you know, those kinds of decisions that, you know, as, as you might guess, and Takas and I've had this conversation, I'm trying to get our board to do some of those tabletop exercises because even though you may never be prepared, developing that muscle memory helps. So that that was what I wanted confirmation on or or not from you, the, considering the answer, you have walked yeah. that journey. 
The answer is those decisions absolutely were all, you know, made and informed ahead of time. But, you know, in, in retrospect, could more effort and energy have been put into that? Of course, you know, absolutely. Thanks so much. Any um, any other questions for Frank? Yeah, I have one, Mary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frank, um, you uh, you like us rely on some significant partners. You know, Amazon, who invited us to that fireside chat, AWS, uh, Microsoft, uh, Cisco. Uh, how supportive and responsive were they when the event took place to getting their on-site support to remediate the problem? I, you know, it was, it's a great question. So um, this is part of your incident response plan, identifying the team that will come in and help post-incident or immediately thereafter. You know, there's gonna be three major categories of it. One is your own team. You know, they'll be active participants in the process, but they'll need help. Bucket number two is your primary tech partners. That there'll be bits and pieces of them. And I'm going to answer your question in a second. The third part is I'll call them the firefighters. You know, you're going to want some you know, forensics engineers that do this for a living. Uh, I, I would strongly urge you not to consider keeping these people on staff. It's like, you know, th by the way, there's a the metaphor here is firefighting. You know, the fire department's down the street. You wouldn't hire your own fire department to help put out a fire once every 10 or 20 years or maybe never. You probably mm -hmm. wouldn't want to have a fully staffed set of forensics engineers. You want to bring them in for a couple of reasons. One is if you hire them and put them in the corner to use when as needed, you know, their their capability will atrophy. You know, these people are constantly deployed. So when you hire somebody in that's a you know, forensics team, you're getting, you know, the best and latest and greatest practices. They're up on everything. So those are the three buckets. All of those things should be choreographed ahead of time. Time to the person. From each one of these three categories, post-incident, depending on the severity, who's responsible for doing what? Everybody has a role to play. I'm um, getting back to the tech partners. This is the one, Jack, and you and I have talked about this. I strongly recommend that you, you kind of commit to some kind of SLA bef ahead of time. Hey, gang, you know, we've invested in you as our lead tech partner greatly, the Microsofts, the Cisco's, the Amazons, whatever. In the event of an incident, who exactly should show up and when are they gonna show up and what are you committed to in order to help us get back online? That should all be done ahead of time. Now, again, in my personal experience, Jack, my, my mileage, but your mileage varies. They're all, they all care, they're all compassionate. However, they're all somewhat risk averse too. You know, like walking that fine line. Oh my gosh, one of my customers was just ransomware attacked. Oh my, you know, mm. You know, and then lawyers get involved because corporate policy and image, they don't want to be associated with it. I mean, there's a lot of that gobbledygook that kind of gets in the way. Iron all that out ahead of time. And we, we could not have got back online in the time that we did without their help and the support. In hindsight, you know, should we have spent a little bit more time and energy on working that piece out ahead of time so that went a little smoother? Yeah. Should have. Did we still get high marks for getting back online in record time? Absolutely. But that, that absolutely should be a focus as part of your incident response planning. No doubt, Jack. Great question. Phil? Yeah, Frank, uh, different direction a little bit. How, how would you assess in general the progress that's being made or, or not being made in discovering the cyber bad guys and and uh, taking them out of action you know i boy this is i need therapy you know by the way when mike and i have a glass of wine phil will invite you um, <laughs> you know i i it, it's I, i've often argued anybody that wants to be a, a CISO, cyber information security officer right the highest rankings if you're in cybersecurity and you want to be an executive and continue to grow in your career, that pinnacle is something we all call a CISO, C-I-S-O. Um, I absolutely believe, based on my experience and what I've uh, what what I've uh, come across in my conversations, that a PhD in psychology is probably more valuable than a PhD in cyber if you want to be a CISO, because you're dealing with people. 
you know, and expectations, and you're trying to convince people to stop doing one thing and another, it's, it's dealing with people. Now, getting back to your question, you know, there's, there's kind of been a sea change. 10 years ago, if you were a ransomware attacked CIO or CISO, you know, who did the organization blame? Oh, how did you, how dare you let the bad guys get in here? Are you kidding me? Okay. So yes, there was a point in time where it was popular to victimize the victim. Wait a minute. What, have we forgotten about the fact that somebody willingly and knowingly broke the law and broke into our environment? If somebody breaks into your neighbor's house, do you blame your neighbor? Of course not. But for some reason, that was pretty darn popular in the cybersecurity industry. Well, now, Phil, that this is happening at such an alarming rate, you know, it's like, oh, okay, right? That that kind of attitude towards individuals who are left to their own devices to protect the perimeter, woefully outgunned by the global cyber trade, right, is starting to change. And what gets lost in this is the fact that there are criminals breaking the law. And what, you know, what is the, what? and, and by the way, in most of it, unfortunately, seems to happen on, from the other side of the globe. It's a perfect scenario. Nation state enemies of the United States of America attacking us in cyberspace. We all know this. And guess what? They don't have to get up in the middle of the night because it's daytime over there where we're all asleep. You know, they get out of bed, have a coffee and start cyber attacking us. It's, so I, that's an excellent question. And the fact that this all precipitates with someone knowingly and willfully breaking the law seems to be forgotten in all this, which just breaks my heart when people stand up and start to point the finger at some under-resourced, stressed out IT department who's doing yeoman's work with the resources they've been given to protect you know, their organization's environment. Breaks my heart. And 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 is and is feels like is on its way out of our industry and and for good for good reason. But not enough cyber criminals are being brought to justice. And I I got a lot of friends in the FBI. It's you know their job in the international courts and stuff. I know it's a focus for them, but I'm sure that a few of these people going to jail would help curtail this, but that's out of my league. I'm not a lawyer. I got a bunch of friends that are lawyers, but I got enough on my plate. But it's a great question, Phil. Thank you. John? Thanks, Mary. Um, hi, uh, John Burke. Uh, hi, John. Program, program manager in the in the federal space doing enterprise systems. Um, I think one of the difficult things for decision makers um, is that they're usually not technical, right? Yeah. Um, and people who are managing budgets are generally not technical. Um, what should be the expectation of, of leadership um, to be able to understand what their risk is so that they can resource it effectively? Because um, there's always that tension between, you know, gold plating versus under resourcing. And, and how should how should leaders expect how uh, to, to be presented that information? You know, that's uh, again, we could unpack that for a while, too. I, I'll, I'll go back to the comments I made earlier, John. Excellent question. You know, I'm a firm believer in that this all starts and stops with leadership. Take the cyber criminals off for a second. Who is mostly responsible for lowering an organization's vulnerability? It's leadership. And if leadership cares about things like, you know, the business continuity planning we talked about earlier and understanding their risk, then I'll argue that that organization's vulnerability is inherently lower than somebody who doesn't care about those things. So then the question becomes, how can, you know, the people who report to leadership make them care? Um, that's, it's tough. It's tough duty. Uh, how do you present arguments for why risk should be a priority and then therefore cyber and uh, invest investments in cyber should line up with those things? If there's a void here, the leadership to just some reason doesn't isn't interested or it's not a priority managing, understanding, profiling risk. Um, that's tough duty uh, and, and why a lot of municipalities are more vulnerable than they should be because there is a void there. And I understand why, you know, there's a lot of competing priorities in local government. By the way, if I didn't say so at the beginning, you know, thank you all for what you do, working in public service to try and help, you know, give back. 
uh, I absolutely applaud you for what you do and thank you for your service. It's, you know, it's woefully underappreciated and unrecognized. And at least on behalf of this taxpayer, thank you very much for all that you do. Uh, that's that that is the million dollar question, John. Um, yeah. And, and again, I, are you kidding me that the person who's responsible for setting the cybersecurity policy is usually two or three levels removed from leadership? Those organizations are all highly vulnerable by definition. If it matters to leadership, it matters to the rest of the organization. I don't right. know how you make them care, really. It's that's tough duty. Well, we're very glad to have a board member here, Frank, just to listen to you. So thank you, Takas, for he he cared enough to be to be here be and here and hear from you. I, I you know, by the way, I do recognize most of you. I, I went back and watched some of the videos you have posted online, and I was here when you introduced Takas as the new liaison January. So welcome, Takas. Thanks very much for your service and what you're doing there. Good for you. Oh, thank you, thank you. We we by the way we had this conversation already yesterday. Uh, Jack uh, probably remember that we uh, began to approach the uh, issue of resourcing of resourcing the uh, you know the the scenario of you know of how to respond and uh, what kind of resources should we have in place and so there was a we had an exchange already on this so, right so we believe that we are all uh, collectively thinking of what the appropriate structure of this I, I see that this is about policy processes and resources probably yep. in this in this order right yep. uh, so we are basically in the policy and processes part and uh, uh, I don't believe that neither me nor my colleagues have any uh, problem to talk about resources. Uh, Chuck tells us always that this is expensive. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> I, you know, even, I, I was teasing even, before you got even, on, you know. Put some Jack numbers on it yesterday. So, uh. Jack didn't ask me to come in here and tell you all indirectly that you should give him more budget, but I'm telling you, give the man some more budget. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> the problem of giving more budget is that we have to take it somewhere else, and you I just mentioned that. Right. Right. So uh, beginning when you put that is not an excuse; it's just a <laughs> a um, description of the framework. So that's, I, at the beginning, before you logged on, I you know my heart goes out to people that are responsible directly for the competing priorities at the municipality level. I understand that the budget, divvying up the budget, is excruciating. One more dollar for cyber is one less dollar for a hot lunch for an underserved youth that that might be his or her only meal of the day. Excruciating budget decisions to make at the local government level. And my heart goes out to everybody that has to be involved in that. It's very, very difficult. In any case, we I think that it's uh, at the end of the case, uh, you, you can always say that in order to be able to provide that meal or that service, uh, you have to, right now, you have to be safe on the uh, on the cyber side as well. Absolutely. It's like it's like having a uh, you know a car and making sure that your all all four wheels are operative. I couldn't so. agree more. And as what I did offer to Jack and I'll offer to all of you as you continue to further your thinking, I know I make myself available to all of my former colleagues, Jack included. You know, if you get to a point in time where you'd like to get in a conference room and have a whiteboard and really talk about the specifics of what should be and what should be up, how you do this and how to do that, Jack knows. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'll make myself available. I don't charge for this. I don't make. I don't profit from any of it. I willingly do it for free because it's you know because I care about local government, cybersecurity, mm -hmm. IT, serving citizens. So. The offers there if, you, if you'd like to take me up on it. Thank you, yeah. Frank. And we and um, talk as you may have a question. Claudia, do you want to introduce yourself? You have a, a a really good question in the chat. So if you would like to introduce, introduce yourself. yourself and then. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure Hi, Claudia. to meet you all. Hi. And uh, I'm, I guess at this point, the head of technology for the Department of Environmental Services. And one of the things I totally agree with you that, you know, 
part of uh, uh, sort of the mandate should be coming from leadership and they should be leading all these efforts. But I also believe that we all responsible, right, for insurance oh, yeah. security. So what kind of things you have implemented or recommended in Baltimore or any suggestions you have for staff, you know, sort of things that we can do at the management level to say, you know, help us mitigate risk, reduce risk uh, by doing ABC. You know, I don't know if it's training, if some of those tabletop yeah. exercises that you recommend for leadership should be also included at our level. Yeah, so uh, awareness is huge. In fact, a lot of progressive IT departments actually, I'll say a dirty word, have a marketing department. Okay, let's call it a communications and an awareness department. You know, you have a responsibility to get the word out, press the flesh. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of soft skills. So if you're a cybersecurity professional, you know, I can teach you how to code, but are you a good communicator? Are you a good collaborator? Are you good at sharing, teaching, coaching? All of those, they, they matter in this space. So training and awareness is huge. You know, again, so yes, you can you can absolutely do those things and should do those things. In my humble opinion, people show up at classes if the you get a little bit of nudge from leadership. You know, if it matters to leadership, people will pay attention to the awareness campaign. It, it just gets better. But yeah, awareness is absolutely paramount. Uh, 90 plus percent of all cybersecurity incidents are precipitated or aided by human error. Clicking the wrong thing, bringing the wrong thing into work, charging my, you know, charging my smartphone, plugging into a critical system through the USB port, you know, when you shouldn't have. I mean, just little things like that happen all the time. Awareness. And then to reinforce, we talked about this earlier. It's one thing to have a cybersecurity policy. It's another thing to put teeth into it. Do you guys have an audit department? I don't know how many I, mean, I got when I was in, when I was in, in 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 my last job I got audited on everything audit financial right. audits operational audits right. I got audited on everything except for cybersecurity you want to put some teeth in your cybersecurity policy each one of the operating agencies should be cyber audited from time to time along with all the other audits your audit department does and then they get a report so now they've got something to shoot for and then it should be reinforced by management hey you guys just got an okay grade on your last cyber audit. You must fix these things. You know that that, and then you know you start to do a little bit of that thing. It because you know, you get an incremental improvement over time, something to build on, and then it, hopefully it takes on a life of its own. This is interesting, Claudia. Again, getting back to I keep talking about psychology, but this point of view: should cybersecurity be centralized or decentralized? You know what my answer is? Yes. Yes. Cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. Yes. But does everybody need to be writing the organization's cybersecurity policy? Well, that's probably the responsibility of one people or few people, but everybody's responsible for living it. Yes. So um, that is a great question. There's an awful lot you can do. Um, leadership you. has got to take on some level of responsibility for making this better. They just have to. And to John's question earlier, pushing that rope uphill, Maybe Takis, from his perspective, can help inform. Maybe it already exists. I don't know. I'm not that familiar with Arlington County. Arlington County. But, you know, but some, organizations some organizations it does, some organizations it doesn't. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. No, much. thank you. Great question. All right. I think, uh, Takis, unless you have a, do you have a question before Frank? Uh, he's, we, we have kept him longer than we promised him. Are you kidding me? This is great. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm like no, one is... step away from the kitchen. I'm I'm, I'm in my home office. I know you, you, you guys, you guys are going to keep going. Go right ahead. I'm fine. This is very insightful, and we will keep uh, talking about that. I, I do think that we have to make uh, uh, our entire organization enterprise is moving into a different uh, tech level, uh, into a different conception of how we operate. Uh, the pandemic is, you know, main. Main, mainly to blame for this, but we are going into that. Uh, there are significant investments that are uh, in the CAP for that, and I we had already a first conversation yesterday about uh, what role cybersecurity should play there. So in, in terms of what we should invest, now st let's start and see how many dollars we should uh, make available for 
for securing these investments as good as we can. So the 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 discussion about uh, having a secure, a safe culture that includes cyber audits and uh, the marketing and the relative decentralization of awareness and you know this kind of uh, a uh, a defense system of thousand points like uh, you know others say and uh, or. You know, the federal government is right now, if I'm not wrong, uh, running a strategy of uh, assume that you are hacked, right, uh, all the time. So that that remains to be translated in uh, into Arlington County policy lines. Yeah. Uh, I know that we have a very good leadership in our department. I, I just expect that uh, um, Jack and his team will uh, will be bringing us the, the the proposals to get our mind structured what i'm definitely for and i think it would open our collective minds is to some sort of tabletop exercise or so, or so kind of a simulation i don't know what this takes uh, and how uh, productive it is so do you think that a simulated case like you know i'm coming from the i'm an economist so i'm coming from the financial work in the financial work we 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 after after many big and disastrous accidents and financial crisis we've learned to a uh, a stress test and to a scenario test so uh, banks for example or or financial institutions or 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 in the stock exchange market so is that something that you would think is it, it's helpful? Absolutely. We talked about this a little bit, Tox, maybe before you joined, but in the incident response planning, the role playing, the drilling, the table topping, so that, you know, in the event of an incident, how you respond coolly, calmly, collectively together, you know, becomes more muscle memory because you've practiced it. Absolutely is a huge part of it. Too many times, I, mean, I don't know, I'm repeating myself for others, but too many times, I've seen organizations write, here's my incident response plan, and then put it on the shelf. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's, it's meaningless unless you put it into action. You put it in action by drilling it, practicing it, table topping it. All of those things absolutely matter and are paramount to your preparedness. Absolutely. So, Jack, next time I start my computer and a smiley comes up and says, you've lost everything, <laughs> I, I will know that this is a drill, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's <laughs> open. Um, one, one final question, Frank. Phil, you want to ask your question, and then we'll 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 move from. Well, yeah, I just wanted to ask if you made attempts, or were you able to make attempts to educate, sensitize, mm -hmm. make more aware Baltimore's elected leadership. Um, if I understand the question, would are you talking about pre-incident, post-incident? I guess I don't understand the context of the question. Pre-incident, you know. Was I making think, I think sure elected that leaders, politicians are not naturally uh, inquisitive about this kind of uh, subject, and I'm just wondering yeah. if uh, you, you've had opportunity to to uh, kind of work on their on their background. The, the answer is yes, it was a topic of conversation from the day I started. There were a number of very tech savvy uh, elected officials in the local government within Baltimore City. The mayor who hired me uh, her, her, was very tech savvy and aware of what it could do for possibly impacting the lives of the people. A number of people in city council, very, very tech savvy and very cyber aware. And what was digital transformation and online safety and security was absolutely an ongoing dialogue and I'm sure still is to this day. Thank you. Okay, well, Frank, a lot of, thank you so much. I mean, this was in Jack, thank you for suggesting Frank, um, what you, um, how you prefaced, um, certainly Frank delivered. So we, we appreciate all the conversation, the dialogue, and we certainly appreciate you offering to come in and whiteboard Frank. I think that would be a, Think that would be a very fruitful uh fruitful meeting so thanks so much for your willingness to share what you've learned and be very frank and candid 
um, with us. I think that really, really helps. So we appreciate so much you taking this time. And feel free to stay. Um, we're give, given the time. I'm going to take the. Um, um, I'm going to move move our agenda a little bit. Um, and Can we'll I say my goodbyes? And yes. Say my goodbyes and thank yous. Then, yeah. by the way, gang, thank you all again very much for the time. And again, on, at least on my behalf, thank you all for what you do in serving the public. And I meant what I said earlier. Jack is that you're blessed to have one of the best of the best. Jack, I mean, and by the way, he didn't pay me to say that uh, at all. <laughs> he, re he really, truly is one of the most well-respected public sector IT leaders in the country, and you're lucky to have him. I'll, 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 I'll see you all again. Thank you very much, and have a Thanks. wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Frank. Thanks so much, Frank. Take care. Take care, everyone. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Bye. Frank. Um, so, the um, because because that went, I think. It was it was good that we had all that dialogue, but obviously we're we may be a little bit a little bit late. I hope um, that doesn't mess up too much of your schedules. Um, wanted while we have talk is here. I want to move to and we'll come back to um, the minutes in the July and August. But I wanted to move um, actually to the digital plan discussion. Um, is um, hopefully you all have had an opportunity to read um, the digital. Um, report that came from the task force and you also have the um, w the presentation from Mike about the principles and I think um, the thing that we've talked about the most in one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations and here in this one in terms of what is what's the best way to move forward with Arlington in terms of um, a digital future and what does that mean so um, open it up to the to the floor for some discussion and um, and see where we are. Uh, so I'll jump in, Mary. Um, Thanks, John. I, I read the report um, that was produced by the county managers task force, um, although three of the authors of the report were county staff. Um, so, you know, it, and the task force wasn't really open to the public or publicized on the on the web anywhere. So it feels like more of a county staff report than I would say um, a product of public engagement. Uh, I think there's a lot of overlap, frankly, between um, some of the things that we put forward and uh, some of the things that were in that. Um, but I think um, there's some there's some problems with it and there's some conflicts with it. Um, I think uh, fundamentally there's the, the focus on elite talent um, is really narrow and kind of um, I think not the problem that we need to tackle from our economic development uh, standpoint. I think uh, the problem that we need to tackle is our affordability. Um, you know, right now with COVID, elite talent can work anywhere and live anywhere. So if we want to attack elite, uh, uh, attract elite talent. They don't need to work here to be employed by Amazon anymore, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I think I think that focus is too narrow. I think there's a couple other big misses. And then I think, you know, the big thing is that we recommended creating a, a 12th element of the comprehensive plan. Um, and this report specifically says not to do that. Um, it advocates um, updating all other 11 comprehensive plan elements to address digital equity only um, and then doesn't say how we're going to set policy for the other areas of concern and somehow with with no real articulation of how this makes any sense and it doesn't make any sense to me says that that will be somehow more efficient than creating a new comprehensive plan element. Um, I, I looked at all the other elements of the comprehensive plan. I looked at the um, the areas in our charter uh, uh, areas of policy advice and I, I went back and looked at the product that Mike had put forward that we endorsed. And I think there's a substantial amount of areas of public policy that just don't fit into any of the other comprehensive plan elements and primarily I think my recollection is that's why we endorsed a 12th element and we we had knocked that idea around back and forth do we just incorporate it into the other slices or do does, does it kind of engage it so um 
you know, I, I've got a draft letter that um, I, I shared with Mary kind of summarizing that. Um, and I think given that the county manager has produced this work product that's in conflict with our previous guidance, it the board probably owes, uh, we owe the board hearing from us again um, based on this new artifact. And, and my um, feeling is that we should, um, we should endorse moving forward, frankly, because the, the the ability to address any of the shortcomings in either of the proposals, I think, can only be done through a robust public engagement process uh, at the level of like level four collaborate based on the county uh, engagement plan. Um, because we need to hear from the broader community about what what digital planning means for us in Arlington, what our principles are, what our values are. Um, and I think that this group, as illustrative as we are, um, is is insufficient to to provide that guidance fulsomely to the board. So that's that's kind of yeah. a summary of where I'm at based on reading yeah. that document. Thanks, John. And uh, we may and Jackie, you're next. Um, John, we uh, if you want to pull up that doc, we may have a time to to look at to look at that. Um, I think it'd be helpful for everybody to to see and. And, and take a look. Jackie? In, in the, um, I, I second John's uh, sentiment, and <clears throat> I want to sort of add a, a, a different co context for the a similar observation. And I would say that the context of the discussion that we've just had with Frank and of the things that are most important for cybersecurity, having a more centralized understanding of policy and process and a, a more direct ability for leadership to affect these in a coordinated way were the, you know, some of the most important things that he talked about. And I think that this decentralized approach that we have, which is really fiefdoms um, of different parts and the the acquisition of software for different purposes through each of these and also the expenditure of funding and decisions about priorities through each individual department. Um, yes, there needs to be some but not having an overall plan that they're all supposed to contribute to for things like cybersecurity, um, I think does make us vulnerable. I think it also makes us vulnerable in terms of the quality of our overall policy, not just vulnerable in terms of um, penetration, but um, it, it doesn't have a cohesive policy with cohesive goals, it's um, it it sort of separates it into department level and makes it a department level plan, and so we need to have something that is a theme that, as the comprehensive plan is supposed to be, goes through is independent and breaks out how that theme goes through all of the others, not the other way around, not how all these independent things might come together, because it doesn't do that at all. And uh, of course, that's, I admit that's been a complaint I've had about a couple of policy issues, but uh, it's nowhere more apparent than it is when you have a policy where you're trying to break ground and stay up to date in a very rapidly changing um, context for um, science and application where where you're trying to um, get the right policy and the right processes to fit the budget and the resources and and you need that before you start parsing the budget not afterwards thanks Jackie other other comments Mary, I can add that I've had the opportunity to put on paper uh, uh, pretty thoroughly my thoughts on this subject, so I don't need to, I hope, repeat that here, but I'll say I was um, 
uh, disappointed by the absence of this report uh, until I had the opportunity to be disappointed by the substance of this report. Um, and so since we have Jack and David here, I would like to just ask very cleanly the question, do you, th do you two think we need a strategic plan? And if we don't, why don't we? For IT, that is. Or for now, digital Mike, services and broadband. Let me, let me just clarify. I want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Are you asking, do you think, are you asking them if they, there should be a 12th element within the comprehensive plan? Correct. Is that I'm the trying, question? Okay. Yeah. Okay, because it's kind of different. I, I read, You're asking for a strategic plan as opposed to the twelfth element of the comprehensive. Okay, for, I guess the right term of art would be master plan, and we've used the term before: broadband and digital services master plan. But I, I read the report that makes a statement against it. I was actually very surprised to hear statements made against that at the budget hearing on March 16, and affirmed by those present. Because um, at that point we never we hadn't even received a report <clears throat> from the broadband task force, and so my question is straight up, Jack, Dave, why why don't we want a broadband and digital services master plan? Well, Frank, if I can, uh, I, Mike, I'm sorry if I can uh, respond to you somewhat. First of all, I, I think just to correct, uh, when Mary and I started this, uh, responded to the manager's call to create a task force. We purposely. Uh, stepped aside and let the group be formed and let them come up with it. They had an agenda, they had a mission, and their job was to come up with their proposal. Uh, both Mary and I share the belief that there needs to be a, uh, an overall plan to how we look at, we tackle the, AF, the uh, change in how the county is, is moving um, in terms of innovation, the exponential growth of technology and such. Um, the group that was put together just to correct something that was said earlier, there was only one county staff assigned to this. That's David Hurley, who was assigned to this, not three staff. The majority of the group was non-county staff. I want to make it clear that David's job was to act as a coordinator for that, that effort. Personally, I, as I said, both Mary and I share the same belief that there needs to be that discussion of what that means. What does, what does the future look like and what are we trying to achieve? As you might remember, we embarked upon a whole series of efforts called Defining Our Digital Destiny. And we talked a variety of subjects. And what they did is try to outline what, not looking forward to next year, but looking 20 years down the line, what's going to happen to the county? How do we, do we put an emphasis on parking lots? Or do we put an emphasis on, on electric charging stations? Uh, what's going to happen with education? What's going to happen with the workforce? So both Mary and I are aligned to that. But the work that came out is really the work of that group. And uh, David can talk to the composition of the group, but there were uh, four individuals who got together and came up with that and presented it. Um, I think they did a good job of presenting their views. Do I agree with everything they said? It's it's really not my choice. It's their, their report that they came out with. And the manager, we had a meeting with the manager on, uh, was it yesterday, Mas uh, Mary? I believe it was. And Tuesday. Tuesday. And Mark was really in th in, uh, excited about the report because it started the discussion. And I think that's where we are. I think we were at, we were at the beginning of a long discussion. And the work that you put together, Mike, and talked about in terms of cybersecurity and how they can be applied and privacy, all has merit, but it plays in the definition of what that is. And I think something John said is true. Uh, I'm not sure I'm on the pay grade to be sitting on that group to make that decision. It's akin to the group that we had that defined uh, the future of Arlington with regards to the subway, the metro. Uh, the folks that came together, the Tom Richards of the world, who who uh, took charge, jumped forward and said, OK, we're going to espouse and we're going to say the uncomfortable, but we're going to say what we believe is necessary. So that's where I am on this is uh, do I do I think we need a digital as a 12th element of the plan? If that accomplishes that overall vision of where we're going, then probably I would say, yeah, if it doesn't, then what is the vehicle to get there? And certainly one of the challenges we have, and again, I'm speaking out of turn, but as a person, an individual, uh, it does take leadership, and uh, we're a decentralized government, you know, and uh, frankly, you know, where does that leadership sit? Is it in the board? Is it a particular board member? Is it a manager? I, I don't think so. I think it's it's probably in a community stakeholder group that says, this is what we believe to be important for Arlington going forward. So not direct answer to your question, uh, but that's where I am on this whole discussion. So I think they did a good job. Uh, I applaud their efforts. I think we should consider it and say, okay, how does it fit? You know, and in terms of what Mike, you've proposed and what others have said, but sitting down and having that forum, a framework for discussion, 
I think that's what's ne necessarily next. And so I'm not I'm not tied to uh, committed to one particular way of doing it. Thanks, Jack. Uh, any other and um, John, you have your letter ready if you um, to, to share, right? If uh, if you are able, if you're given the rights to share. Right. Yep, let me pull it up. Um, OK, and great. Jack, I don't know what the constitution of the group was that was only formed because again, it wasn't made public. But the authors listed on the report, there are five of them and three of them are employed by. Uh, apologies, I had a network, but three of them are, are employed by Arlington County government based on their LinkedIn profiles. So, um, well, we know of one. John, done. I can tell That's you straight up that there's only one. two of them. Yep, there's only two, and I don't know what you're specifically looking at, but about the authors is to myself and the DLC and the deals mm -hmm. and management intern. The rest yeah. are uh, residents. So, no. All right, I will go back and um, send that in writing based on what I found. Maybe I misread somebody's profile. Yep. Uh, here we go. So I'll just leave it up there for people to read for a moment. Yeah. Can you make it a little bigger <laughs> for my old eyes, John? Thank you. Okay, and then you can move um, from a pro. Yeah, yeah. So the last part is what we're from a process perspective. The commission would like to highlight two areas of concern. Um, and Mike, I know you had some pieces too. Um, I. One of the things that, and obviously I'll, I'll um, as some of you are digesting this, I've had the opportunity to look at it. Um, I would, I would really like to see us um, giving next steps in terms of the Arlington Way, you know, engaging the public um, as as well. Um, I think. I think that would be, and I see where you say public engagement process in that number two, John. Um, so maybe we just reference yeah. reference that which you said in terms of the. Um, I think you said four, right? Level four is that what you were saying? Yeah, collaborate um, as yeah. defined in the county's public engagement plan. Um, yeah. I think the guidance for which level to select. Um, you know, one of the pieces of for level four is if it was going to impact a, a comprehensive plan element. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously that's this would qualify for that. Um, right, right. OK, good. And that that's an you think that's enough in terms of highlighting the, the cross between what what it says in the in the county public engagement plan. That'll be enough. That'll that'll state it. Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's a okay. defined. It's it's nice that we have that because we can just reference which yeah. level we think is appropriate. As you said, it's a framework, right? Which we yep. rarely have on this tech commission. Um, hey, John. Yeah, no, go ahead. There are a lot of good words here, but can't we put up front at the very front and then reinforce at the very end our strong recommendation that making the 12th sector of the, the big uh, comprehensive plan wheel is in our view, far and away, the best way to do this and indeed volunteer that uh, ITAC could uh, facilitate the process that would guarantee an open process with every voice, is, every voice heard that has an interest in this subject. As it is, it's kind of buried in the middle and the end is a little, in my view, kind of squishy on, squishy on what we want the board to do. That's fair. 
Um, I, you know, thanks, Phil. I'm trying to write something. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, no, I also, listen, it really helped, John, for you to get this down. And Mike, I know you, you were, you wordsmith some things as well. Um, and so there's, feel free to, to, um, comment. Okay. I think there's um, no better resource than iTech for making this happen in the interest of all. Well, Phil, I think what you're thinking about too, that we could help with the public engagement, right? Precisely. Yep. Which is what we do with the the chart, the um, what we used to do with the cable as well, remember? When we had the public engagement. That's right. That's right. And Mary, I'll I'll respond by saying I did in fact uh, do a bunch of wordsmithing. I shared it out kind of late, so everyone's had very little time to look at this. But I would say, um, if I were to summarize where I was going, um, I'm feeling a real lack of urgency here. You know, we pretty much wasted a year, and I was present at the founding events in November 2019 and December 2019 that Jack was referring to. I was in fact instrumental in getting many of the original task force members to participate. And then we've sort of atrophied and, and we've got a report that's been, I'll say delivered awkwardly and um, terribly late. Um, and now we're looking at the substance of that report and we're saying it in some very important ways from our perspective, misses the mark and misses a mark that we've already defined. And so I would say if we were gonna get sort of action oriented and recommendations to the board i would have five some of them are very much like john's the first one would be put municipal digital planning firmly into the arlington way that is the whole purpose of the uh, writing exercises was to create a starter kit that would officials in the county about the breadth and scope of the consequences of digitization and and to solicit public input on you know, challenging and emerging policy questions. The second would be to articulate the information technology decision rights and accountability framework in clear policies for the entire county. That's, we sometimes talk about that as this is gonna be a strategic plan or who controls cybersecurity, uh, but that's basically the part that's most controllable within the county by its own policies. Who gets to make the calls on these things? And at present, there doesn't seem to be a well understood a set of processes that can be audited and shown to work. Um, the next one would be broaden the scope of municipal digital planning beyond economic development to quality of life for all residents and visitors. The fourth is, is, is new, I think, and that is employee information technologies to support community values of caring, fairness, and shared ownership. Um, so, so in particular, beyond the economic development potential here, and beyond the public service delivery efficiency here is the opportunity to make people in the county feel like they are participants and, and owners in a county and citizens who are self-governing in a democracy and have access uh, to the government. And I think many recent authors of uh, municipal digital planning would say that's the most important part. And then lastly, I would say treat privacy as a civil right, not merely a property right. So I was disappointed to see the, the uh, Arlington Digital Principles report, uh, notwithstanding our charter and some of the things we put forth, uh, define privacy as narrowly those instances where the county itself collects data directly from citizens. When in fact, I think the real issues are what does the county want to be happening on, for example, collection of surveillance data of law-abiding citizens using public spaces. So the, the way it's formed in the Arlington Digital Principles piece, I'd say just misses the entire issue. I don't think anybody's looking for Arlington to mishandle people's personal identifiable information. It's more like there's gonna be so much information and and what's identifiable and what's identified and what's re-identified and what's bought and sold is going to be um, very difficult for anyone to get their arms around. Um, but there was at least an opportunity in publicly owned spaces for the county to define what's permissible and what is not. And, and frankly, the little bit I can learn about the Arlington 
Clarendon safety and innovation and who could possibly be against safety or innovation is sensing uh, instruments on public property um, for social goods that I haven't been able to get my mind around. So I just listed five actionable things. I've, I have put them in writing. I can send them. If uh, we're going to deputize John to wordsmith it and up the action a little bit, uh, those are the ones that I would nominate. Um, but I think we are kind of at a breakthrough point here. It's, um, it's not clear that our advice is landing with any constructive consequence um, anywhere in the county. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jackie, did you have your hand? Did you want to make another comment, or is, was that hand from an earlier? It was earlier. Okay, just checking. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, all right. Um, anyone else? Any other um, comments? And John, do you mind that you you just got nominated to um, to help integrate the draft? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I, I just want okay. to hear hear from people. Um, yeah. so is there is there a clear consensus among the members of the commission that establishing the, the 12th sector is a priority? The 12th element. The 12th element. Mm -hmm. Or do we still want to entertain other possibilities of achieving the vision that Jack talks about and distributed responsibility and accountability? And if so, what is that after all anyway? You, you know what my view on this is. So. Right. You, I, yeah, I just Phil, wonder, I, is, is it possible to kind of have a poll of where everybody's at? Of course, we haven't heard from everybody. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure, sorry to jump in, but I'm not sure that things are um, opposite to each other the way you described it. I think you can have a 12th element and the policy and process in that 12th element can easily identify what the distributive responsibility is. So I'm assuming <clears throat> that it would, that it could and would actually be both um, a single element that shows what the process is and the leadership, both at the um, overall level and at the distributive level, that that's actually needs to be part of that. Thanks, Jackie. Um, others? Martha? Uh, you're on mute still, Martha. I think I see this uh, very differently than most of you. I mean, I was impressed by the cybersecurity uh, discussion that we had that we're not ready. And before we, you know, we don't have to be number one in everything. And so I, I think that some of what we're trying to do is too big. Why not wait and see what other uh, communities are doing? While we work on making sure that nobody uh, I had someone I know whose name I won't say, one of the major medical parts <clears throat> of D.C., you know, they, they paid the $17,000. And we had a discussion at, today about whether or not we should pay. And I, for me, that's sort of secret stuff and shouldn't be discussed in such a public way because what we showed in part was weakness. So, you know, when you're talking about these other issues that, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could have equity or whatever? I'm not there. Martha, how do you feel about adding a 12th element then? Are you? What would it say? OK, so so for you, that's not what what you believe is the most. Let me make sure I'm getting this. What you believe is the most critical part is just making sure that the um, infrastructure is protected. So the cybersecurity is your number one priority. Is yeah. that is and, that true? And that's right. And what, what the speaker talked about 
was that, uh, gee, it would be nice if we could some pe- put some people in jail. Sure, why not? Hey, go back to Charleston when the pirates were there and see what the community did to the pirates to stop piracy. And how about the Israelis and and Tebby? You know, I mean, it, they're not the most popular people now, but they took care of the people that caused the problems. So I, I think we need to have a way more structured discussion about what the priorities are. Okay, thanks, Martha. Kevin, what's your sense? Uh, if you're speaking, Kevin, you're still on mute. I apologize because I don't have a strong sense and I should, and Greater Minds and I have already focused in on it. So I kind of defer to John and Mike on these issues and, and appreciate the level of focus that they put on the issue so far. So I'm gonna just sit back and thank you for the discussion. Okay, thanks, Kevin. All right, anyone else? Frank? As long as you're off mute, now you're off mute, Frank, go forth. Now you're back on mute, Frank. <laughs> Let's see. Now you're off mute, okay, Frank. Now I'm off. Yeah, Go ahead. I had muted, and I don't know how it muted again, but maybe you maybe you put me on. No, I just want to just uh, uh, say that I do agree that we should uh, support a 12th planning element for digital, and uh, how you know how what that involves is obviously going to be setting forth the pro- the process, and and I think the public engagement that we want to. Uh, Foster, I think, will help you know tell us where we need to go on that. Thanks, Frank. Okay. All right. Um, Phil, I'm just calling on you only because um, you were the one who raised the question. Do you feel like you've got a better sense of where people are at this moment on the? I, I do. Are there other members who I haven't uh, noticed? Because I only see a few pictures. Yeah, I think some. Some came on and then went off. I think we've got, I don't think we've missing anyone else at the moment as I'm well, looking on my list. You, how, how would you characterize the, the degree of consensus that you heard? Well, my sense is that Jackie's for it. Um, you're for it, Frank's for it, Mike's for it, and John's for it. And I think Martha's saying, look, my, my number one concern is cyber. Um, and and so I think that's I think that's where I think that's where we are. That's my sense. What do you what's your what's your sense? I agree, and I'm hoping that that shines through the revised letter that uh, is in the works right now. Yeah. Okay. So and and for so, both of you, I'll say I I think the way it's been framed is that if you look at what we previously sent forward in consensus back in whenever it was, somewhere between September and November, then as John is doing in his letter, he says, we, we expressed a consensus back then. And if you compare that consensus to this report, here are the differences. So it's good to reaffirm that consensus. But we, we waited a long time for task force input and not receiving it, we went ahead and offered what we had produced ourselves. And I think what John is doing in his proposed letter is saying, here's what we had already recommended, here's how the new report differs from it, and we still recommend what we were recommending before. The task force report didn't change our mind. No, exactly. I mean, obviously, one of the reasons I wanted to see it was because I wanted to make sure before we came, before we nudge the board again, talk us, um, that, that, that there wasn't, that there wasn't anything, anything that would change. I would, I would also, direction. I'm sorry, should have had my hand up. I would also, speaking very candidly, like to see us get a little more respect in this process. And I think we can do that by exploiting a unique capability that we have because of our experience and our commitment and our long-standing view of this to facilitate a very broad public discourse that results in implementing this uh, 
12th element and doing all the other things too that Jackie is talking about as well as Jack and put ourselves out there. I, I think we could be the, the indispensable uh, facilitator in this whole process. Well, I think to your point, Phil, that we really think this is important, right? I mean, this is this is a critical framework that we think the county really needs to wrestle with. And not that we have the answer, but we really think that the looking at this in terms of a, a really focused, just as Jack said, just like the Metro, what do we want to be in terms of digitally is critical for the future of Arlington. Um, and John, I think your hand up was up first and then talk us. Yeah, I just want to make the point that I don't think um, engaging in a development of a comprehensive plan element is mutually exclusive from tackling the absolutely urgent and critical cybersecurity issues, Martha. Um, I, I don't think those things are mutually exclusive and I think um, everyone here would be fully throated endorsing um, the right investments in that cybersecurity is job zero. The challenge that we've had is that um, we have not had an opportunity to have an off the record briefing about what's going on. So we're throwing darts at in with a blindfold on at a moving target. Um, so we don't know how to advise the county board on what to move forward on. And there is a specific exclusion in the Virginia open um, open meetings, public meetings law for this type of conversation that a board such as ours can meet um, outside of the public eye to have those conversations. Um, we just can't take any formal actions uh, during that closed session um, as as a board. We can do it for safety. We can do it for procurement. We can do it for a number of exclusions that are in the public public records. And so um, I would be very much interested in having that session um, off the record outside of uh, the public eye so that we could provide effective policy advice on the on the cybersecurity issue. Um, but until we do that, um, I'm trusting that Jack is doing that for the board. Um, and and so, you know, our mandate to advise on policy, I think we the thing that we lack is we lack any sort of policy whatsoever. We lack any sort of policy framework whatsoever. Every single issue, time and time again, broadband, you know, whether we're investing in in the the gates of Boston, whether we're you know having a broad, we have no policy framework for any of those conversations whatsoever. When it comes to the budget time, we have no way to t track or trace any of the budgetary investments that are in the county manager's budget of the capital improvement plan to any framework or, or set of policy priorities that have been endorsed um, at all. Uh, and so I think it really leaves us with no footing um, uh, on which to provide sound advice and counsel to the, to the board. Thanks, John. Takas and then Jackie. Um, I, I, I'm absorbing with great interest the conversation, first, uh, first of all. So I'm not, it's not my place and it's also, uh, also not correct to intervene. Just wanted to highlight a couple of things that are of, of interest to me and maybe Fingers to my colleagues as well. Cybersecurity and uh, all the challenges that come with that are definitely a uh, kind of a trigger for this conversation. I perfectly understand that you can actually take the cybersecurity challenge and compartmentalize and work only on this uh, without necessarily changing everything, uh, anything, uh, you know, in all other dimensions of digital. Uh, of, of, of digital Ireland, which exists, but it's not very well organized right now. I'm not organized around policy principles. But think of uh, what I've been seeing through the pandemic now, and uh, you know, having also a better exposure to the to the, to the enterprise, the organization, are other things. Uh, I really agree with Mike on the issue of. Uh, uh, data privacy, safety, uh, you know, uh, the assurance that we provide to citizens uh, about uh, what happens to their data and the data that we collect first of all from most Arlington <laughs> County, which is a amazing number of, you know, items uh, and it's growing. Um, we have, uh, we begin to implement software. We have algorithms that work on there. We don't really necessarily have quality criteria for governance by algorithm. Uh, we, you know, we 
we approach these things like we have a task, we find the appropriate solution, but it doesn't necessarily rhyme with uh, some some sort of of uh, of, um, of criteria. Uh, we begin to have requests from our, um, uh, for example, from our fire department or police department to uh, you know implement sensors and other things. We have um, uh, requests from our. Um, uh, you know, permit system uh, uh, to implement, uh, you know, deeper and more comprehensive and more automa automatized uh, e-governance. So all this begins to be a lot. And I do think that uh, for now, we just see everything, every, every task or every request as an extension of an existing governance line that is covered by the 11 elements of the comprehensive plan. Now, I would uh, say, though, that at some point it is worth intellectual exercise to think whether they transcend that and they and uh, there, needs, there needs to be a set of criteria of, for example, do no, do no harm or, uh, 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 you know, we have to uh, make sure that the data of the citizen have always to be always accessible for the citizen if, if requested, or that we have to have a digital a um, uh, data privacy commissioner, or that we have this kind of uh, this kind of institutions that others other um, to Martha's uh, comment, other communities are already thinking and beginning to implement. So I'm not, uh, I think that this is a good uh, a good point of departure. I, uh, as a board member, I, I really have to admit that I need this advice. <laughs> uh, if you know, if you're an advisory commission, this is the kind of advice I, I would appreciate to have. Um, how this all begins to work together and how we can make coherent um, uh, decisions. I've been, uh, I've been challenged to make a decision on the implementation of sensors on public street lights. And I had to balance between, you know, my beliefs X and the assurances that this is not so bad and just a pilot and we have a separated server and what have you, and uh, we'll figure it out. So I didn't have really a set of criteria to point back and say, you know, we decided at some point that this is the, this is what we want to accomplish in the public realm. This is the kind of data we want to uh, to collect. This is how uh, this this is the functions of government we want to to serve. Uh, another big area is this, the, our uh, relation, the relationship between government and businesses or the economic system. This includes, for example, the use of our fiber um, network of the, you know uh, connect Arlington, etc. So, yes, I see a lot of mass, a, a critical mass of decision points that would be probably uh, far better um, governed, framed in a in a comprehensive plan element, just like we do with housing and we do with uh, natural resources and. Thank you, Takas. And Takas, I really appreciate you staying this whole time. Oh, no, no question. How much you're, you're engaged and how much the... But, well, the, the well, well, your your government begins to learn. You know, we have automatic learning. We have yes. uh, AI learning on the street. Tomorrow we may want to manage parking with this or housing. Yes, So exactly. what are the guiding principles for that? Right. No, very good uh, point. You know, who should we, <laughs> what are we going to put in the RFP when we hire somebody to write an algorithm for us? Yes, that we've had that, absolutely. Those are the things, the procurement piece as well that we've talked about, thank you. Um, I, I have to, um, I know it's getting to be late, late hour. Um, the, uh, what I'm understanding, um, John, you have, Grace graciously uh, agreed to be the to to wordsmith and take feedback from people, and then at our June meeting we'll look and see whether that meets the what what the sense of of the commission is, and then we will if if indeed 
that does meet um, the consensus, we will forward that to the board, Takas. Yeah, so why don't I make a motion, Mary, to that effect? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion uh, that we, in light of the uh, Dig Arlington Digital Principles 2020 document that Mary provided us to at the last meeting, we update our recommendations to the board for municipal digital planning um, and uh, provide a sense to the board about how that document um, fits or does not fit with our prior recommendations and how to move forward. Do I hear a second? Second. Frank seconds, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those against? Yes. Jackie, are you against or in favor? In favor. I'm in favor, okay. Because okay. <laughs> there was a lag, I was just checking. And anyone abstaining? Okay, motion passes. All right, thanks again. You know we don't normally go long, so I appreciate. Um, um, I think we'll we'll put the other agenda items. We will, Frank, hold on to the legislative piece. We need to, um, we'll, we'll address, um, address that. And um, I will entertain a, a motion to, a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, thank you. Second. Thank you, Frank, a second. Who's the second? John, John were you say ah okay double team there all right John second all right all right all those in in favor aye. Yeah, aye. That, that was that was a more joyous uh, aye I think <laughs> <laughs> uh, nay any anybody against opposed to, to to sitting here or abstaining all right all right thank you all we really appreciate you I mean we're so fortunate to have this talent um, dedicated to volunteer to do this and talk us. We really thank you for staying the whole time. And this really mm -hmm. shows that that the, that the advisory, advisory commission really plays a critical role in your decision making. So thank you very much. Well, absolutely. I'm sorry that I cannot always because uh, it is just no, a busy time and I had to 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 be half an hour uh, late today uh, no, due to fine. schedule. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. care, everybody. See you Thank next you. month. Bye, Mary. Bye. Bye. Mary. Thanks. Bye.